Well, let's show the full mechanism for this reaction. Let's make this like a cyclic intermediate. One sec. But that sounds right, yeah. Should I do it like the same step or in seven? Like first have this go and then have the cardio pattern? Let me catch up with you, but uh, that's a good question. So we protonated the carbonyl oxygen, then we had the first nucleophilic atom attack, and then we did that proton transfer step, where the nucleophilic atom lost a proton by giving it to the former carbonyl oxygen. We combined the two asterisk steps into one step, so we kind of skipped over the hemiketal stage. And now we're at this point over here. Um, and uh, what was your question? Like, I know it's a good leading group, but should we show it in one step, like the OH at the end attacking? Right the carbon, neil carbon, or right. should we do like the water falling off, making carbocation, and then attacking itself? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So it's good that you remembered all these steps so far, but it's hard to remember all of them. Um, so that's the purpose of the handout, to give us something to fall back on if we forget. So let's see if we can answer that in the handout. Where are we on the handout now? Carbonyl O leaves as water. And then? Nucleotide. Right, and the key word here is subsequently. The point here is that, that this is the answer to your question. These are going to be two separate steps. First, the carbonyl oxygen will leave as water, and only then will the second nucleophile attack. And this is not resonance, because this is, uh, this is not just moving pi, on, uh, pi electrons around. So this is actually very important that you, get that, uh, that you get that correct. So that was a good question. We have to have the nucleophile attack only subsequently to the leaving group leaving.
okay, that's a complicated reaction, but there was only one step that you weren't sure about, and it was good that you, uh, you stopped and thought about that. So uh, the only step that you weren't sure about is whether these left simultaneously or sequentially. That actually is one of the most common ways people lose points here. So it's good that you, uh, you paid attention to that. So yeah, um, the, the, uh, the, as the handout indicates, the nucleophile attacks subsequently to the water leaving. By the way, if you just look at these two steps, this is a reaction we learned about last semester. Here we have the water leaves, and then this oxygen attacks the carbocation. What's the name of that type of mechanism? Uh, intramolecular? Yeah, but an intramolecular what reaction? Is it an E2 or a addition reaction or what? When we have first the water leaving and then this nucleophile attacking that carbocation. Um, it's two steps, so it's SN1. Okay, that's right. So this is just an SN1 reaction. We're going to still see, keep seeing lots of SN1 and SN2 reactions, but they're going to be part maybe of bigger reactions now, this term. Why can't we do an SN2? Why couldn't they happen simultaneously? Well, who was our nucleophilic atom? Mm, the neutral oxygen. Yeah, well, last term we learned that neutral oxygens are not good enough nucleophiles for an SN2. So that was the answer to your question. That's why TAs do take off a lot of points if you try to show these happening simultaneously, because that would contradict what we learned last term. A neutral oxygen can't just kick a leaving group off. It has to wait for the leaving group to leave and then attack the carbocation. OK, so it had to look. Uh, like this. That was the only part of the whole uh, setup that gave us any troubles. So that's good. What type of uh, what type of product do we get here? What's the name for this type of thing? Um, I wanted to say a ketal. Good. That's right. How do you know it's a ketal and not a acetal? Because it started with a ketone and the carbonyl carbon is attached to two carbon. That's right. Is it still called the same if the O's are connected? Yeah. I mean, we would call it an intramolecular ketal. I don't know. Or No, I'm sorry, that was wrong. You would call it a cyclic ketal. Okay. That's actually a commonly used term. This is a cyclic ketal, but it's still correct to call it a ketal. It's definitely not a hemi ketal, because we're not just halfway along. We've totally kicked off the carbonyl oxygen. It's crucial to remember, neither of these were the carbonyl oxygen. The carbonyl oxygen is gone. That's right. Where did these oxygens come from? What types of functional groups were they? Dial. Yeah, they came from alcohols. Yeah. Good. This is also crucial. Suppose that you were trying to make this in a synthesis. Many people have difficulty making this in the synthesis because what type of functional group do we need to make these? An alcohol. But they don't look like alcohols anymore because they've deprotonated. So it's important to realize um, that you can make an acetal or a ketal out of an alcohol even though the oxygens don't look like alcohols anymore because they've deprotonated. But this is still a good way to synthesize this type of thing with an alcohol. We have to remember that very often nucleophilic atoms lose a proton and then they, they don't look the same in the final product. Okay, so uh, that gives us this. Uh, a lot of the TAs tend to call this the Birdman. I don't know, yeah. it kind of looks like a bird man. All right, that's fine. Although, I, in some ways, I don't like that term because it makes it seem like it's a special type of molecule that's different from everything else. But this is just yeah. totally the same as when, we, when, when the two alcohols were separate. It doesn't really matter whether the two alcohols are in the same molecule or different molecules. It just so happens that when the same molecule, it looks like a bird man. But the chemistry is not different uh, in either case. And this, as we talked about, is a good protecting group. Um, because now we don't need to worry about other things messing up the carbonyl because the carbonyl is not here. How could we get the carbonyl back? What could um, we add to this to get the carbonyl back? Add water and acid, so yeah. we each three of those. That's right. And in a second, we're going to go through the mechanism for that, because that's important. And that would unprotect it and take us back to the carbonyl. OK. Um, so um, that's good. By the way, what is this protected from? Um, it's protected from a lot of things, but in particular, it's protected from nucleophiles and bases. Acetals and ketals are protected from nucleophiles and bases. That's an important thing to have uh, in your notes. So if you want to um, treat the molecule with a nucleophile or a base, but you don't want it to mess up your carb mess up your aldehyde or your ketone, you can protect it first as an acetal or a ketal. Acetals and ketals. And bases? Yeah. Full acetals and full ketals are protected from attack by nucleophiles and bases. I think they're also protected from oxidizing agents and reducing agents, although that doesn't come up as much. So they're protected from a lot of things. Uh, but it, uh, especially they're protected from uh, nucleophiles and bases. Okay. They're obviously not protected from acids, because we know that if we That's treat this with acid, we could get it back to here. So, but they are protected from nucleophiles and from bases. So that comes up um, a lot.
By the way, hemiacetals and hemiketals are not protected. They, they will react with nucleophiles and bases. So it's only if we get the full. It's only halfway done. They're still in the alcohol. Yeah. It's only when we go all the way to the full acetal or ketal that we have a protecting group. 